Okay, everyone, so welcome. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Michael Toomey. He's a graduate student here at Brown University. He works in uh, Professor Stefan Alexander's uh, research lab. Um, Michael is interested in high energy physics, ast ast astrophysics and cosmology, and in particular, the intersection between uh, questions about the universe and uh, methods of machine learning and computational science. So today he's gonna to be talking about some ways that we can use unsupervised learning to uh, maybe look into how dark matter exists or doesn't exist in the universe and has a number of nice introductions for both uh, the physics topics as well as the machine learning topics. So with that, Michael, uh, take it away. Great, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so this is a body of work that I've been working on for about um, maybe like a year and a half now with uh, Professor Stefan Alexander um, here at Brown and then uh, Professor Sergey Glazer at uh, Alabama. Um, so the whole premise of the idea of my talk is, you know, would it be possible, you know, dark matter, a lot of us, we don't know what it is. Um, could somehow we use some of the novel methods and machine learning, bring them into physics and try to say something about dark matter without making too many assumptions about what it is or what it might be. Um, and so throughout the talk, as he said, I'll sort of, you know, lay out the physics problem, but also along the way, I'll try to get through some of the jargon of machine learning and try to make it a little pedagogical in that sense. So as we all know, the standard model over the last 50 years has been incredibly successful. Um, if we sort of just restricted ourselves you know, to earth and we never looked up in the sky, you would probably think that we had the world pretty well figured out. Um, but the second you get a telescope out and you start looking around, you notice that actually we are missing quite a significant fraction of what the universe is. We don't understand that. And that goes all the way back. A lot of us all know the story with like Fritz Zwicky, um, Vera Rubin, you know, she measured rotation curves. Um, and then sort of we had this idea that, oh, there's this entire dark universe, there's dark matter, there's dark energy. Um, and then for those out there that might be mon believers, well, we have the cosmic microwave background, which is pretty convincing evidence that at least in the case of dark matter, it's some sort of particulate matter um, that we still don't understand or really know what it might be. Um, and then, you know, we've been doing this large research program over the last, you know, decade, you know, last few decades. Um, with little to no results, um, you know, searches for WIMPs, other, you know, dark matter candidates um, have sort of come up empty. Um, so, you know, it's entirely possible that dark matter is something that we haven't thought about yet. You know, there's all kinds of models on the market. You, know, you also have axions, uh, could be machos, primordial black holes, but, you know, it seems every test, every experiment we do, it seems like dark matter is sort of being elusive. Um, but you know, what do we know about dark matter? We do know that dark matter interacts via gravity because that's how we inferred its existence in the first place. Um, so sort of like the premise of this line of research is, is it possible you know, using purely information from dark matter's interaction with gravity, is there a way that we can put some constraints on you know, what dark matter is? You know, is it a wimp? Is it primordial black holes? Is it something more exotic like superfluid dark matter? Um, so potentially interesting um, and you know powerful distinguishing feature is dark matter substructure. Um, so on large scales, so we have the lambda CDM model of cosmology. Um, on large scales, that's pretty successful. Um, but once you get to smaller subgalactic scales, um, substructure predictions of regular cold dark, mar dark matter models tend to break down. So you have the core versus cusp problem. Um, so when you do simulations of cold dark matter you find that the cores of galaxies should be a little bit more cuspy, but actually in reality, they look cord. Now this could, there could be some baryonic effects that are sort of washing out the cuspiness, but there are some other problems um, out there as well. So it's sort of on these smaller scales, things aren't looking so good, um, but you know, that could perhaps you could have warm or hot dark matter that could wash out uh, substructure on these smaller scales, or you could have other types of dark matter that even more, that are even more exotic, such as superfluid and dark, uh, and, and condensate dark matter, um, which can, can form very exotic uh, substructure by comparison to regular cold dark matter. So if regular cold dark matter, you know, it's just gonna be like spherical subhalos, um, but something like superfluid, you know, which has some interesting motivations, um, I won't get into that, but it forms things like vortices and disks. So a vortex, just to be clear, it's like a one dimensional, it's like a string of mass. Um, and that's gonna be sort of important. Um, so sort of in this line of research, so just to make everything clear, we're sort of going to be playing around in, you know, when we're training our machine learning algorithms later in this talk, we're going to be sort of looking at, you know, these two disparate forms of dark matter um, when we're doing our analysis. So I just want to go through a bit 
you know, a little bit of the superfluid dark matter idea. Um, so superfluid dark matter is sort of, you understand where its substructure comes from, uh, from the gross pavitsky and Poisson equations. So it's completely described by that. Um, and then if you do out a bunch of math, you get a system of quantum mechanical hydrodynamical equations, and you find that uh, the bulk velocity, uh, the curl of that is zero. That implies that there must be some sort of vortex. So we expect vortexes to be in, if dark matter is superfluid dark matter, it have these strange features. Um, so again, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because when we do our simulate, we're going to simulate what lensing images look like, and we're going to have a couple of different examples, you know, with different types of dark matter, different kinds of substructure. So this is one that's really going to be less familiar. So just to go over, you know, what to expect from where it comes from. And as I mentioned, as I've been mentioning, you know, substructure is, you know, a feature that we expect that can distinguish between these, you know, quite different types of dark matter. And probably the best single probe of substructure is going to be strong lensing, specifically galaxy galaxy strong lensing. So this is a situation where you have a foreground galaxy with a dark matter halo, um, and then you have a background galaxy far behind it that is getting gravitationally lensed. Um, and substructure in that main halo will have an impact and perturb uh, the lensed image relative to that same dark matter halo if it didn't have any substructure. Um, and also one would expect that if the morphology of substructure was different, say you had vortices instead of spherical subhalos, that the lensing signature itself might have different characteristics. Um, so this makes these strong lensing environments very good to actually potentially distinguish between, you know, broad classes of dark matter based solely on their substructure. Um, and so currently, you know, as far as strong lensing data goes, there's not a lot of strong lensing data, um, but there's a lot of new experiments coming online that's planned to, you know, potentially have up to tens of thousands of strong lensing images that we could potentially train something like a machine learning algorithm on to identify between them. Um, and so one might say, well, why, okay, so this talks sort of about the machine learning approach. Someone might ask, well, why wouldn't you want to use something like a more traditional Bayesian approach, right? You have some model for substructure, you go fit it to the data and see if you can inject and infer, you know, how good does this fit? Um, the main problem with that is it's incredibly computationally difficult to do this. Um, you know, it takes, you know, days probably to get a good fit to the data to, you know, get good convergence. Whereas if you had trained a machine learning algorithm, say on simulations of data, you can run it and, you know, almost instantaneously, it can tell you whether or not there's, you know, what kind of substructure there is. It could potentially extract population level statistics, which some people have done, um, such as like the slope of the matter power spectrum for the sub halos, and that sort of information. Um, and so well, Michael, I have a question about the previous slide. Uh, this slide? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, the one uh, after this. After? Yeah. After this. One, yeah. Um, so when you say that these uh, Bayesian approaches are uh, maybe not, you know, to be desired, is it because they're slow or is it because maybe in assuming something about about the structure you're you're limiting yourself? So to both. Work? Okay. Exactly. So you could sort of pose the same uh question to, I think, both the Bayesian analysis and with machine learning. So if you did supervise machine learning, you you have to sort of, as, which I'm going to go over a little bit, there, there, there'll be a slide where I go over some of our initial supervised results. Um, but in that case, you're sort of assuming a model, but you're training on the simulation. So it's sort of like the same thing. But what I'll get into later in the talk is where the difference of unsupervised comes in. I don't have to make any assumptions anymore about what that substructure is. Um, but then, yeah, some of the other problem too is these can be quite computationally expensive to do anyway. Um, Okay, and then before going on much further again, you know, in this talk we're dealing, you know, we're sort of comparing, you know, when we're doing our machine learning algorithms, we want to throw something in there to see if, you know, we can look between the two in both the supervised and unsupervised setting to see if we can distinguish them. What happens, you know, if you have something like vortex, what does that lensing look like? Um, and sort of, I just want to give you a qualitative picture. It sort of has this, so a vortex has sort of the effect of just doubling uh, the image behind it. Um, so you can sort of see off to the right, this image is showing you as a vortex is moving in front of a single background galaxy. So you can sort of see this doubling effect as it moves down across the image. Um, and also an interesting fact about vortex lensing is it doesn't induce any magnification. So you would think that that actually might make it a little bit more. Oh, uh, we seem to have lost Michael. For the last year or so, oh, there's uh, been- Michael, you're- um your sound cut out for like 20 seconds. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. 
Is that you, were, you had just you had just talked about um, how the, the vortex uh, splits the image in half and causes okay. duplicates. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So yeah, just qualitatively I, again, what the vort the effect of a vortex is, you know, just sort of this doubling of the image, um, and it doesn't induce any magnification. So you would think that it might be difficult to infer its uh, presence in substructure, but actually our algorithms do quite well. Um, so over the last year or so, there's been some uh, decent amount of work where people have gone about trying to use machine learning to infer, you know, different properties of dark matter substructure, um, and also trying to do this, can we distinguish between dark matter? Um, so people have done this in different regimes. So I mentioned strong lensing was one method. People can also look at tidal streams, also astrometric observations. Um, here's a couple of papers that I've done on this work. So one is our initial supervised work. Um, then there's some other work I had done uh, with Professor Kushiapis and Kiriakos on uh, looking at astrometric signatures, so background quasars and subhalos in our own galaxy. I won't get into that, um, but there, there's you know a decent amount of work in this regime. But most of these, all of these, actually, all work under this sort of supervised umbrella of machine learning. Um, and so, since I've sort of now kind of going in the direction where I need to start actually talking to you about how we implemented this method of you know trying to identify dark matter based on substructure using machine learning, I should probably get into some of the basics of uh, neural networks and machine learning. Um, so the basic type of machine learning we're going to be using here is based on neural networks. Um, and so I think a lot of people in the audience, you know, certainly have heard, uh, you know, what heard of neural networks, but the basic, so the basic structure of a neural network is you have uh, a series of nodes, so that correspond to layers, um, and then there's weights that connect both layers, connect between layers. Um, so you have usually have an input layer. So for example, that would be your data. So in this case, this would be a strong lensing image, um, and then you have a series of hidden layers. So these are layers that you don't really get into, um, and then you have an output layer. And the way you go from one layer to the next is you do this process of multiplying it by a weight matrix. Um, and so effectively, what you there's then you've all probably heard of the process of training your machine learning algorithm and how you go about doing that is you end up learning sort of this optimal weight matrix, which you can sort of think of it being somewhat like a rotation matrix that sort of, you know, puts your data in a way that the network can use to answer the question that you throw at it. Um, and so, you know, uh, just as a simple example of like how you go about training is typically one calculates a loss. Um, so, you know, you have some initial weights that are completely random for your architecture. Um, you know, put your data in through and in the supervised case, for example, you know what the answer should be. So for doing classification, we would know, you know, whether there's substructure or not, you can compare your output answer to what you expect. And then you can calculate, you know, how bad or how good that was using this notion of loss. And then the idea of training is updating those weights, the weights that are connecting the layers to actually optimize how good, how close your outcome comes to reality. And so sort of this, it's very similar to like, you know, fitting functions and all that fun stuff, except it's a little bit different. Um, so this graphic here is sort of showing maybe a qualitative idea of what like a loss landscape looks like. Um, and so you're just updating these weights with this process of stochastic gradient descent until you sort of optimize um, how well you can learn. Um, an additional thing that we include um, in our analysis is we specifically use, uh, so for our supervised analysis and for our unsupervised, our architectures, all, all of our successful architectures use convolutional layers. Hi. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah. So in from your previous slide, you saying that you update W. So do you also up, update BI? Uh, yes, you also update the bias. It would look exactly the same. So it'd be bi is equal to bi plus eta uh, di. Okay, BI. Yeah, so you update on, on, on parameter. Okay, thanks. Exactly. And this would be, you know, you could even imagine like putting a one and a two, because like in, for example, here, you have, you have three weight matrices, right? So you'd actually have to do that for each weight matrix. And then mm -hmm. there's a bias for each layer. You'd have to do that for each. Um, hey, hey, Michael, um, I have yeah. a naive question as well. Uh, how do you know that the weights that you find during this training uh, procedure are appropriate to use for any other uh, data set? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, it, um, yeah. So, of course, if you let's say like you trained on data for um, okay, in the context we're looking at strong lensing images, let's say we trained on data from Hubble, right? And then we want to go to apply this to a future experiment like Euclid. Would that be valid to continue to use it? Is that sort of the question you're you're asking? Um, uh, yes, correct. 
you, you'd probably expect that you might induce some error, right? Because it's sort of designed to work on that set of data. And so one way to get around that would be to potentially use something called uh, transfer learning. Um, so you would sort of expect that, you know, on a certain data set, you know, there might be some intrinsic properties like some noise or, you know, there's a point spread function uh, for the observation of the telescope. And so you could start off with that initially trained architecture and then train it on just a very small subset of this other experiment that you're interested in. And then use that to just do the fine adjustments that might have to be done to the weights because it's going to be most of the way there anyway. Um, but it's still possible that it might still work well. Um, but yeah, you probably have to be careful and do something like uh, transfer learning. I think I can send an, uh, a video lecture explain about that. I think there's uh, one of the lecture from uh, Harvard explain why the the new data will, uh, will work well with the old training uh, parameter. You can see it and send it over chat. Yeah, so it's definitely still possible. It would still work well, but maybe if you're trying to be careful. Um, no, there's a, there's a theorem to prove that. Oh, is there? Okay, I'm not aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, okay, so let's see. Right, so then um, all of our architectures, we include this uh, convolutional layer. Um, and the reason that we, um, and, all, and as, as I was saying before, our successful architectures, we use convolutional layers. And the reason why um, we find that these are a lot more helpful is because they're sort of designed for working with image data. Um, one of the problems of a regular fully connected layer is Imagine that if we had centered all of our strong lensing images exactly in the center of the picture. Um, if we then got a picture where the strong lensing images image was still in the picture, but it was off center, um, the neural network would actually start classifying those incorrectly. Um, and one of the problems is because that regular neural network doesn't exhibit any translational invariance. Um, the addition, so the addition of these convolutional layers has the effect of introducing translational invariance into neural networks. And so now allows you to identify if there's any strong lens in the image. But there's another reason why convolutional layers are interesting. Um, and it's because they do this thing called feature extraction. And sort of, we have, I have a quick schematic, two quick schematics here, sort of showing you just the basic features of the convolutional layer. So you have convolution, which sort of makes sense for a convolutional layer. So basically what you do is you have a series of small matrices, which we call filters. Um, and so the way you can think of, you know, the filters are sort of like a weight matrix in the regular fully connected neural network. And you're trying to sort of learn features of your image. So you could imagine like learning, say a straight line, uh, for example. So if you had a filter that was like, zeros, uh, like a three by three filter, zeros on the left and right column. And then down the middle, you had like say ones. You could imagine if you take that filter and you convolve it over your image, you're sort of like emphasizing all the vertical features in that image. Um, and then you have another layer called a pooling layer, which basically is just a way to reduce the dimension of your input data. Um, so you basically take say two by two squares on your image. Uh, you commonly use something called max pooling where you just take the maximum value um, from that set of four pixels. And then you now map that to a new image that is now half the size of the original image. Um, and so these are like the two successive uh, operations in a convolutional layer. And sort of the way that it's now different and the way that you can sort of understand how it's now translationally invariant is the inputs to the fully connected layer are no longer pixel positions. So like if you, if you could imagine taking one of our lensing images and compressing it down to one dimension, each input to that neural network is going to correspond to a pixel and say the brightness in that pixel, that's your input. But in this case, what's happening is your input layers to this fully connected layer now correspond to each single filter. And each filter is sort of learning a feature of that image, depending on how activated it is from, multiple, from convolving it with the image that you put into it. Um, so basically it's saying, okay, is there any straight lines in this image? And then that sort of filter gets activated and that's put into say like the bottom node here in this architecture. And then some other features correspond to the other input nodes. So, and then the job of like this fully connected layer now is sort of learning correlations between these features. So you could like imagine if we're training this on a cat or something like that, and it learns to find, you know, 
little triangles. That's like the ears, maybe like a shape, like a T that's the nose. And it just learns that when those two are, those two neurons fire, that says, oh, okay, this is a cat, right? But now we're working in, you know, obviously with strong lensing. So it's a little bit different, uh, but that's the general gist of CNNs. Cool. Um, <clears throat> uh, Michael, could you, um, this is kind of something I was confused about when I tipped my uh, foot into machine learning in the past. Can you explain the Re ReLU uh, activation function just briefly? Oh yeah, so the ReLU activation function is um, basically, okay, so def as far as the definition goes, um, well, first of all, the point of having activation function is to introduce nonlinearity into your architecture. Um, and so ReLU corresponds, basically what you do is after you've done, so let's just go back to like just the basic neural network architecture. Um, so you, we have this uh, bit inside the cyan. So that's like your weight matrix times, say your input plus some bias. And then after you do that, so that's a linear operation, you then go over that with this activation function. And so there's a series of activation functions people use. And one of them is ReLU activation functions. And that just corresponds to um, setting. So it's basically like a piecewise function. So all values greater than zero go like f, f of x equals x. And then all values below that go as a zero. Um, so I guess this picture sort of schematically shows this. Um, and it's sort of, I don't know, sort of empirically found that it's good. I don't know if there's a great reason. Um, why exactly uh, people use it, uh, other than to empirically it works good. Although generally speaking, you don't want to use strict ReLU. You probably want to use leaky ReLU. Leaky ReLU is where you uh, have a value that's not quite zero as you go to the left, um, because then you run into the problem of vanishing gradients. Um, I don't know. Does that? I, I don't know if that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, yep, so I think I'm done here. Okay, and then, okay, so as far as going forward, so now I'm gonna show you a quick supervised result and we'll get into the unsupervised stuff, which is more what's interesting. Um, but obviously to do this work, we have to simulate some data because as I said before, you know, we were in a situation where we don't have a lot of data and we're also interested in trying to identify dark matter. So obviously, even if we had all the data, right, we couldn't go out there and just, you know, we don't know what the labels are, right? Because we don't know what dark matter is. Um, so our three classes that we're considering uh, for both of our supervised and unsupervised analysis are dark matter halos with no substructure, um, dark matter halos with superfluid substructure, which we approximate as a single vortex uh, with approximately 1% the mass of the dark matter halo. Um, and you know, one might ask if we go back to like that uh, page on superfluid dark matter, why is there only one? Yeah, so the reality is you could have lots of uh, vortices, um, but there is some work in the literature that suggests uh, that vortices can actually coalesce over time to form one larger vortex. Um, but then my other argument could be, you know, this is just a proof of principle and to see if we could, you know, if dark matter is drastically different, if there's substructure that's drastically different, can we distinguish? Um, and then our final simulation is the one on the far right, where we just have a bunch of spherical dark matter subhalos corresponding to something just like non-interacting cold dark matter. And so basically, this is a single slide summarizing our main results of doing a very basic supervised analysis. So we basically train a classifier to classify between those three different simulations. Um, and you can, so I'm not going to go too much into exactly what this curve is saying, but basically it performs, you know, incredibly well um, at distinguishing between uh, dark matter, different types of dark matter and between, you know, with substructure and without substructure. Um, and so that it can do that up to, so it's got nearly perfect classification at around 1% the mass of substructure, which is about where we think uh, the total fraction of dark matter substructure is. Um, but it even performs quite well down to, I think it was like a thousandth of a percent uh, of a fraction of a thousandth, one thousandth of the dark matter halo mass. Um, it even performs quite well down to there. Um, but this isn't quite interesting because again, this analysis sort of assumes that you have to sort of assume some models and go train a machine learning algorithm on that and go see, you know, does it think this data is consistent with this? Um, and so really, you know, that's not that different from just a Bayesian analysis. It's sort of just a different method, right? Um, so our recent work was sort of our ultimate goal um, when we were doing the last uh, result I just showed. We wanted to extend on that and then do the sort of unsupervised route. Um, and so that result just came out recently. And to do that, I sort of have to explain to you again, a little bit more uh, neural uh, information on machine learning and um, exactly how we implemented that. 
Um, so the backbone architecture that we're, we're using for this analysis is something called an autoencoder. So I think what everyone will appreciate from this schematic of an autoencoder to the right is it looks quite similar to a neural network. And it basically just is a neural network, except you have this bottleneck in the middle. Um, so, you know, you have the same process if you have these weights connecting the layers, and then you do the same process of, you know, you multiply the weight times the input, you, you uh, use an activation function at the very end, and then you just iterate through. Um, but then there's another difference. Um, so let me also note that there's sort of three uh, structural components. There's the encoder network, which looks like just a regular neural network. Then you have a latent vector, which is like a bottleneck. So that's usually only just a handful of nodes. It could be more, but it's a significantly uh, smaller amount of uh, data compared to the rest of the network. And then you have the decoder network, which then builds up the architecture. Um, and the idea of an autoencoder is usually to take an input and to reproduce that input at the output. And at first, that seems like a nonsensible thing to do. Right. So what, what good have you done if, you know, if you've done that? Um, and one of the reasons why that can be useful. So one example where people use this is to, for example, denoise images. Um, another sort of example where people use autoencoders is they don't go up to quite the same size as the other one. They might use something like an autoencoder to make a blurry image, you know, more precise or something like that. Um, our implementation of an autoencoder in this work was to use it as um, an an anomaly detection algorithm. Um, and so the whole point of anomaly detection is to sort of use this notion that you can train this autoencoder architecture. Um, in this case, we're using an autoencoder. You can use other architectures to do anomaly detection, by the way. So we, we also use a restricted Boltzmann machine in this work. Um, it doesn't perform as well, which are reasons I may get into at some point here. Um, but the idea is that you train this autoencoder to be very, very good at reconstructing input data for a given class. And then the idea would be if I give it data from something that's different, right? So let's say we train this autoencoder on simulated data with no substructure. Um, you would, over time, as you train it very, very well, and it's very good at reconstructing that, you would think if I were to give it now data that contains substructure, that it would now not be quite as good at reproducing that input data. And what you can then do is you can then sort of set a threshold. So what you can get is you can get a distribution of loss. Remember that evaluate, you can evaluate sort of how well your architecture is at doing some task, something that you're asking it to do, whether it's classification or in this case, reproducing the input image. You can calculate the loss. And so you can look at the distribution of losses for a set of your data and then compare that to the class you trained on and then just maybe some other data. And then you can identify data that is anomalous, hence the name anomaly detection. Um, and then by setting various thresholds, you can calculate um, those ROC curves that I showed on the other page, um, which give you a idea of how well your architecture performs at doing the task you presented to it. Um, and so here's some example data of our simulations um, on the top line, and then the corresponding reconstructed image on the bottom line. Um, so this is for a variational autoencoder. I won't get into the details of what a variational autoencoder is, but it's a autoencoder that contains convolutional layers. So remember that those are the layers that are good for dealing with um, image data. And it additionally has this extra property that is why it's called a variational autoencoder. But again, I won't get into that. Um, and you can just appreciate, I think, that it does a quite good job of taking input data and it compresses it down to a bottleneck that is significantly smaller. I think the input dimension is like 10,000 nodes. And then at the bottleneck, it's about 100 nodes. So it compresses it down pretty significantly. Um, and it's able to build that image back up again, um, relatively faithfully. Um, and then here are distributions of the reconstruction loss. Um, so these architecture, these are the four architectures we use for this analysis. So we have an adversarial autoencoder, variational autoencoder, a sort of vanilla deep convolutional autoencoder, and then a restricted Boltzmann machine. Again, I won't get into the exact details of what these different autoencoders are. But I think what everyone should take away from this is that using this approach, you can visibly see that we can distinguish between these two different classes. And so again, what's being plotted, it's a distribution of the reconstruction loss. So basically, it's how close was the output of the architecture to what I put into it. Um, and you can see, for example, the restricted Boltzmann machine, which is all the way to the right, you can't distinguish between the two data sets at all. Um, and my main reason for that is to use a, the restricted Boltzmann machine architecture that we implemented, we actually had to compress our two dimensional image down to one dimension. 
And so it kind of makes sense that that would be a lot harder to actually distinguish between anything because you're throwing away that extra information, you know, relevant spatial correlations. Um, so it turns out that our adversarial autoencoder was the best architecture, um, but even the variational autoencoder was quite well as well. Um, and so here's the corresponding ROC curves. Um, just to give you a numerical sense of what's good. So anything above like 0.9 is considered great performance, um, especially for something unsupervised. Um, in fact, really anything above 0.7 for unsupervising is considered pretty good. For supervised, not so much. Um, so I have two different ROC curves, one for two different models. We don't have to get into exactly the difference between them. Model A is you know, good enough to look at. Um, but you can see these algorithms are quite good. And I should also mention this is specifically, again, these are architectures that are trained on data with no substructure. And we are then passing in images with vortices and subhalos and seeing if it's able to flag those as anomalous or not. Um, and you can see it does quite well at doing that. Um, an additional metric that we sort of use as a check to see uh, how well our analysis is performing is something called the Wasserstein distance. Um, so basically, it's a geodesic between two probability distributions. That's just the definition of this metric. Um, and so the schematic to the right is sort of um, kind of giving you an understanding for what that would be. Um, so we take if we take our two dimensional image and we just sum down one ac one axis so we can press it down, say, the horizontal axis. Um, that's what these plots are showing. Um, and so one image is for the uh, original image. So this is the simulated image that we had. And then the other image, so the one to the bottom left, that corresponds to the reconstructed data. And so basically the idea is to see how close those two distributions are. So in this case, the distribution is gonna be like pixel intensity for our strong lensing image. Um, and we use that as additional metric um, just to make sure that everything is consistent with our uh, anomaly detection uh, algorithms. Uh, and so one of the, uh, so another question someone might ask, okay, so we can determine whether or not there's substructure or not in the data. Is it possible with these algorithms that we're using to distinguish between the subhalos and the vortices? Um, so if you just uh, separately plot the distribution of reconstruction loss for, again, for the architecture trained on no substructure, um, you find you can't distinguish between subhalos and vortices. And you might say, okay, that makes sense. You didn't train the algorithm to look for that. So we further trained um, our algorithms on the subhalo data. So that might be more consistent with what the community thinks dark matter might be. So is there anything that's anomalous uh, in the sense that it's not consistent with CDM? Um, and so actually it turns out that if you train an architecture on just subhalos, and you do anomaly detection, you find that you actually still can't distinguish vortices, at least with the architectures we are using uh, from cold dark matter. But what's interesting is that our algorithms actually find the reconstruction loss. So these are the plots that you actually see on this page. The reconstruction loss for no substructure is actually lower than the reconstruction loss for the data we train the architectures on. So that seems to imply that the architectures that we were using um, were not quite good enough at actually extracting the information of substructure, um, which I guess is sort of, you know, not great. Um, but so that's, you know, sort of for future work for us is to try to work on architectures um, that can actually try and extract that information. Um, so we're looking at some other algorithms such as graph neural networks that are a little bit better suited for working with sparse data. So data sort of like strong lensing images where you have a lot of pixels that are very dark um, so maybe they're, you know, and also I should note that even though, oops, going too far, even though, um, you know, we aren't quite successful distinguishing between some of these and vortices, what gives us some hope that we should be able to do it just with the choice of the correct architecture is that in the supervised case, um, as we saw in the ROC curves, we were quite easily able to distinguish between, uh, subhalos and vortices in the supervised setting. Um, so it's not like the information isn't there. It's just a matter of getting uh, the correct architecture and getting lucky in training. Because um, unsupervised is inherently more difficult than supervised training. Uh, and then an interesting thing that uh, we sort of discovered, although we don't go too much into it, we're still sort of trying to understand this, um, is that actually if you look at the mean squared error for data with substructure, when you're looking at, when you're passing data with substructure through the autoencoders trained on no substructure, um, you actually can see the imprints of substructure in the loss. 
Um, so normally one compresses the loss down to a single value. Um, but if you don't compress that down to a single value, so you get a matrix that's the same size as the input image. Um, and then if you look at the loss, you actually sort of can see in this case, what I've done is we have a, so the far left image is the loss for a simulation with no substructure passed through this architecture. The image next Okay, we'll wait for uh, Michael to reconnect. Um, this is a good slide to be stuck on, I guess, so it's kind of interesting to look at. No, yeah, yeah. Did my internet crash? Okay, I think it did. I guess, yeah, but uh, welcome back, yeah. <laughs> okay, where, where did I uh, cut off? You had just, you were about to explain what the middle uh, figure uh, represented. Okay, um, okay, can you all see my screen again? Okay. Yep, perfect. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so yeah, so what the uh, middle image, it's the same image as the one to the left, but with vortex substructure um, in it. And again, we were careful enough to make sure that the total mass of the image on the left and the middle were the same. And you can see by eye um, that you can sort of make out the position of the vortex. Um, but of course, you know, one needs to be careful when making any claims here, because um, we're working in the ideal situation of simulations. Um, but this is a sort of a direction that we're interested in looking into, you know, could you use something like these architectures to localize the position of these substructures and maybe say something about this. Um, I'm not going to go too further into that. It's just an interesting thing we came across that needs more work and more thought. Um, oops. There you go. Um, so yeah, so now I'm going to conclude. So I think the, the main takeaways of this work is that unsupervised machine learning algorithms definitely have the power to infer the presence of substructure. Um, at least in the context of simulations. Um, and actually, we're, we're quite confident that you could probably even apply this to real data and at least say whether there's substructure or not. We have played around with this a bit. Um, but based on the work we've done so far, we aren't quite able to get to the point where we can distinguish between different substructure models in the unsupervised scenario. Uh, we are quite convincingly able to do that with supervised architectures. Um, and we're currently looking into using more uh, advanced architectures such as graph neural networks um, that should be better suited to something like this um, to try and extract that information because it's pretty clear that that information is there. It's just a matter of getting the architecture, the right architecture to extract that information. Um, and so based on the work we've done, these algorithms can be useful in the sense that they can determine if you have 10,000 strong lensing images to determine the most anomalous data for further follow-up by dedicated uh, say a Bayesian analysis or even a supervised analysis. The idea being uh, that as subhalos get closer and closer to strong lensing arcs, they're going to make the data less and less consistent with say data with no substructure. So you can then pass it off to some dedicated algorithm then to go extract that and probably be more faithful that the results you will get will be favorable uh, if you have to spend you know, a lot of computation time to try and extract information about that particular environment. Um, and then furthermore, you know, obviously we're working in an idealized situation. We're working with uh, in the re regime of, uh, you know, simulations. So one would have to be careful to extend beyond what we've done here and make even higher fidelity simulations. For example, one could consider perhaps there might, you know, of course there's going to be some structure in the um, lensing galaxy itself, or sorry, the lensed galaxy. You know, if, you know, that galaxy has some structure, um, would that impact, would that be falsely flagged as the effect of, say, substructure or something like that? Um, so that's some work that we're currently looking into as well. Uh, and with that, I guess I conclude. Uh, thanks. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so uh, can I talk? Can I ask, can I ask uh, some, uh, some questions? questions? Yeah. So, so uh, maybe, maybe my is my ignorance in machine learning, machine learning but, but uh, 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 what, what I learned, I learned well, well, in my knowledge, is, is uh, 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 so unsupervised learning, learning 
uh, can help you to grip your hip quicker and we're getting a lot of echoing. Michael, are you hearing the sound through your ears? Yeah, let me, uh, I, first, I can't see the mute button. Uh, yeah. I get it. Uh, where is it? Uh, I think I have to stop sharing to find it again. There it is. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Sorry, John. Okay, so so uh, I, I as far as I know that the, the unsupervised learning will help you to re re reproduce the picture with the noise. That is correct. Yeah, so that is, that is one of the things you can do with unsupervised learning, right? So no, removing noise from data, right? So basically, is this the idea is that because of the, the middle layer is is very narrow, then basically you 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 compress information through this this narrow layer, and then that's why all of the unnecessary information, I mean, uncorrected information like noise will be like screen now. Is this correct? Yeah, so that's definitely uh, how I would understand it, right? Um, and so my, my question is, uh, uh, how, how do you use the, uh, exactly how you use um, the un unsupervised learning to study the, the data other than the noise screening? Um, so I guess it depends on what you mean by noise, right? So um, the, way, the way we're using it is that images that have substructure, right? Yeah. They're not going to be, the reconstruction of that data is not gonna be as good as that without the substructure and that that signal shouldn't be considered noise in this case so the the effect of substructure isn't noise i think noise would be say detector noise right so you have some you know gaussian noise from your instrument yeah. that would be the noise that would be washed out i believe in this circumstance i have a sort of related question about the unsupervised learning approaches um so it sounded like you take a large batch of simulated data without substructure and you train the uh, autoencoder on that. Then you introduce the data that has different sorts of structure in it and show that it doesn't do a good job reproducing um, through the through the reduced uh, uh, central part of the encoder. However, doesn't that kind of count as supervised learning because you passed it um, a bunch of data that had a certain class and you said, hey, train on this data that has this certain class. So is it is it truly unsupervised if you're doing it that way? Um, well, it's okay. So, to, okay, we're sort of getting down to definitions. Um, I think we would argue that it's definitely unsupervised because the training is completely in the environment. All weight updates are done according to the data with no substructure, right? And we're just our our point of using these other data sets are just to say if you were to go out there and use it, would it flag these things as anomalous? So we're sort of quantifying how good it would be at identifying substructure. So I guess maybe you could say it's maybe kind of semi-supervised, but it really isn't because all updates to the weights of our architecture are purely based on data with no substructure. Like in an actual, uh, in a realistic system, I guess, then you wouldn't be planning on taking all experimental data and training the encoder. You would train the encoder on simulated data and then pass to it the experimental data. Exactly. Okay. And th there are, we do have some ideas for actually training this on real data. That's something you could absolutely do and maybe do the inverse problem where instead you do, you know, train on real data and then you can sort of have a theory killer in a sense that you simulate, you make a simulation with some, you know, dark matter prediction, put it into the autoencoder trained on real data and say, is this consistent? Is this consistent? Is that consistent? Um, so, I don't know. So yeah, you can sort of play both games, but we're playing the first game here. I've got a question. Um, okay, so so it seemed like when you trained um, when you trained your autoencoder without substructure, right, on images without substructure, and then you pass through images with substructure, the reconstruction loss was the lowest for no substructure, right? Um, yeah, the lowest for no substructure in all cases, dependent, no matter what we train the architecture on, the no substructure case was always the lowest distribution of reconstruction loss, which is a little bit unusual, you would think, at first. Uh, 
And so there's no chance that maybe there is no substructure. <laughs> well, since we're working in the regime of supervised um, images, we actually know that the data we were giving the architecture contained substru substructure. So that's why we know that, um, in fact, even though the distribution of reconstruction loss with no substructure is lower, we know that the actual data was was substructure. And I think the reason for that is the unsupervised training that we're doing. So again, we're trying to update this to you know improve. It wasn't actually capable of extracting that smaller information of substructure that would be able to differentiate. It wasn't able to extract enough of it to say anything to distinguish between vortices and sub payloads. So at my first order guess at what it's sort of doing is identifying that there's some sort of broken symmetry in the image because a, a nice subhalo with no, sorry, a nice dark matter halo with no subhalos is going to have probably a nice decent symmetry to the lensing effect. But the second you start throwing some perturbations in there with like subhalos and vortices, you're sort of breaking that symmetry. So I, I feel like that's sort of what it's kind of identifying at this point. And this hasn't really uh, learn that say if we're training it on dark matter substructure say just regular sub halos that actually the little effect of that sub halo is relevant and important information that it should be keeping track of but that's why we're sort of looking at more advanced algorithms uh beyond just a regular neural network uh type of scheme to see if that works yeah kind of along these lines can i also ask a maybe So a slightly naive question. It seems like the, the, the kind of tests you've had are you know, slightly binary and that is like, is there a substructure? Is there, or is there not substructure or maybe a little more discreet of what kind, what kind of substructure is there? But do you, can you imagine like in the future, or do you expect to be able to, it kind of looks like you can just look at this image and you, you can, you know, the loss, those kind of loss maps, it seems like you could try maybe just actually, you know, get, you know, say, uh, the actual shape of what uh, some real data, if you fed it in, what kind of what substructure you would expect to see there? Do you, do you think that's feasible? Or is that just a... Um, so I, I think maybe sort of a, maybe one thought that we had this, I think, sort of along the lines of what we're saying, uh, of what you're saying is we were thinking maybe it might be possible with something like that uh, mean squared error image I showed you, where you could sort of see the imprint of the vortex to maybe imply um, how, what maybe what like the convergence map for like the substructure looks like. So, sort of information about the mass density in the lensing plane. Um, and maybe you might be able to say more beyond just classification, maybe say something about, you know, because you, you might be able to quantify, uh, you know, the effect of, you know, that background galaxy being lensed. Uh, and maybe say something about how much mass is there. Uh, obviously, that's very uh, speculative right now. Um, but it's possible you might be able to extract some information along those lines. <laughs> 